We've mentioned a few times in other videos that we use PFSense as our firewall here at Two Guys Tech. It's the system that protects our virtual servers and PCs from the internet, filters and blocks bad IP and DNS addresses, and acts as our VPN endpoint. Brandon thought it would be a great idea to walk you through setting it up start to finish. Let's get to it. What is PFSense? Well, PFSense is a high performance software firewall that's built on top of FreeBSD. PFSense is made and maintained by the company NetGate and as a product comes as either pure software or or as a physical hardware appliance. NetGate also provides a community edition of PFSense, which is free to use. All you need to do is bring your own hardware. We'll be installing the community edition of PFSense in this video. We started using PFSense here in the channel because it has all the features of an enterprise grade firewall, has a massive community behind it, and has plugins and packages that extend its functionality beyond just being a firewall. It's also open source, which is something we're big supporters of. This would be a good time to talk about network setup and how you'd connect and cable in PFSense into your home network. PFSense will sit at the edge of your network between your internet service provider or ISP and your home network. Its job is to protect the devices and systems behind it from outside access and attack while also managing outbound traffic from the clients behind it. Let's look at a network diagram to visualize this better. At the top here we see the internet in all of its cloudy goodness and directly connected to it is our soon to be PFSense firewall. Think of the lines connecting between the pictures here as physical connections in the real world, as in the ethernet cable coming from your cable modem or fiber ONT connecting directly to your PFSense host. On the other side of the PFSense host, we have another connection that will run to a network switch that all of our devices connect to, including wireless access points, which are not shown here. From the diagram, you can see how things connect together and it's pretty simple. Okay, let's get the requirements out of the way for PFSense. To run PFSense, you're going to need a minimum of a 500MHz 64-bit CPU and a minimum of 512MB of RAM. That being said, you need to make sure that you choose hardware that will meet your requirements. The pfsense.org website has a great breakdown of how much CPU power you will need depending on your expected throughput. For example, if you've got a 1 gigabit internet connection at home, then you need to make sure your CPU has multiple cores and runs at at least 2 GHz. You'll also need 1 GB of storage to house the full install. We'd also recommend that your host has at least two network interfaces, one to connect to your ISP and one to connect to your home LAN. Requirements out of the way, let's open up a browser and head to pfsense.org, click on the download on the right, select our architecture, we'll choose AM64 for a 64-bit CPU, select USB Memstick installer in the installer dropdown, select VGA in the console dropdown, and we'll leave the mirror location as New York, USA. If you live closer to Frankfurt, Singapore, or Austin, Texas, you can choose one of those mirrors for a faster download. And now we'll click Download. Save the file and expand it. You'll need something to expand the gzip compressed file like WinRAR if you're on Windows. Now that we have the install image, let's burn it to a USB stick for install. We'll be using an imaging tool called Etcher, which is a free ISO and image to USB flashing tool. We'll leave a link for it in the description below. The flashing process is super quick and easy. First things first, we'll head to Flash from File and select the expanded .img file we downloaded and extracted. Now we'll select our target device, select our 8 GB USB stick, and then we'll click Flash. You'll get a privilege escalation request to run the process, so click OK and Etcher will start flashing the USB stick. It takes some time to complete, so let it finish. OK, now that's done, let's install this thing. Before we boot off our installed USB stick, we need to connect our PFSense host's WAN uplink. This is the connection that will serve as the internet connection side of things, so either connect it to your ISP's ethernet connection or whatever system you intend to use as your access to the internet. Now we'll boot off our freshly created USB stick and start the installation. On our hardware we'll be installing PFSense on, F12 brings up our boot menu. Which key you hit to get your BIOS boot menu up will likely be different, but once you get your boot menu up, select the install disk and boot from it. Just for a quick moment, we'll see the PFSense installer boot menu. You can hit enter or wait the three seconds for it to continue loading the installer. Okay, the first screen we're greeted with is their copyright and distribution notice stuff. In a nutshell, it's telling you that PFSense is open source and distributed under the Apache 2.0 license, and you can't charge people for the use of it, and don't pretend that it's something that you made. Great. We're not worried about any of this, so hit enter to continue. All right, cool. Now we're actually starting the installation. At the welcome screen here, we have a few different options. Obviously, install is what we're looking for here, but if you want to get to the rescue shell or restore a configuration from a previous PFSense install, you could do that here too. But installation is our objective, so we'll hit enter here. 
On the key map selection screen, you can choose your keyboard language layout if you'd like or need to. Use the arrow keys to move around until you find your particular key map and use the spacebar to select it. For us, since we're in the US, we'll leave it default and hit continue. On to the partitioning screen. We have a few options to choose from here depending on your hardware's configuration. The first option, AutoZFS, guides you through setting up the disks and partitioning using ZFS as the file system format. ZFS is awesome and has tons of features that are useful for redundancy and fault tolerance if you have multiple disks, which we don't. The next two options, AutoUFS BIOS and AutoUFS UEFI, pertain to how your computer's BIOS is configured to boot your host. Most modern hardware fully supports both boot methods, with UEFI being the modern standard compared to BIOS, which is considered the legacy boot mode. You need to choose the right option here depending on how your host's hardware is configured. When in doubt, reboot your host, pop into your BIOS or System Setup menu, and have a look. This host is configured to boot into legacy mode, so we'll be choosing Auto UFS BIOS. The last options are manual, giving you the ability to set up your partitions through the installer, and shell, which allows you to drop to a shell and issue partition commands directly if that's your thing. Anyway, select the option you want to use and hit enter to continue. We'll be asked if we want to use the entire disk or partition a chunk of space for PFSense. This is going to be a dedicated PFSense box and only a PFSense box, and the disk inside is just for that purpose. So we'll be leaving it set to entire disk and hit enter. Obviously, doing this will lead to the destruction of any data that is currently on the target disk. So you'll get one last chance to back out. Hit enter to move on. Next, we'll need to select our partition scheme for our install. The PFSense documentation recommends using GPT first, and if your hardware has issues booting after installing, try using MBR. So we'll be following the recommendations and selecting GPT and hit enter to continue. Before the installation begins, we get a quick look at the partitions that will be written to disk. ADA0 is our internal SSD that is the target for our install. We can see all of the partitions and mount points that will be committed to disk as part of the installation. Below we can also see the partitions on the USB stick named DA0. Nothing will be applied to the USB stick, so don't worry. We'll hit finish to move on. And we'll be asked one more time if we're really, really, really sure about committing these changes to disk. Let's hit enter and get this thing moving. Alright, PFSense is installing as we speak. This is a pretty quick installation depending on your target disk, so let it finish. One more thing before we reboot, we're being asked if we want to drop to a shell to make any final manual modifications. No we don't, so we'll hit enter to continue. Congratulations, your installation of PFSense is complete. Last thing to do is to hit reboot, pull out our USB install disk, and let the system boot normally. Let's do it. First boot takes a bit as the OS generates a few things, moves stuff around, and gets set up for its first time. Be patient and let it complete. Welcome to the console screen of PFSense. This is all you will ever see from the console side of PFSense with all of the actual configuration and work being done on the web UI. You can make changes here, like set up IP addresses and interfaces, reset to factory defaults, reboot, and of course, drop to a shell. What we're interested in seeing here are our IP addresses. Our host has two defined network interfaces on it. One is set up to be the WAN port or the internet facing side of the firewall, and the other is the LAN port being the interface that will serve and protect your home network and devices within. By default, PFSense will start a DHCP server running on the LAN side of the host. If you connect this interface to your existing network that already has a DHCP server running on it, you're going to have a bad time. PFSense attempts to detect which port should be used as your WAN port on first boot, so make sure to check and see if your WAN IP address looks correct to you. If not, use option 1 to walk through assigning your adapters to different roles, or swap your physical network connections on your host. Our next step is to connect the PC with the web browser to the LAN connection on our new PFSense host and get on the web UI. On your computer connected to the LAN side of your new PFSense host, open a browser and head over to https colon forward slash forward slash 192.168.1.1, the address we saw on the PFSense console. You should be greeted with the PFSense web UI login. The default credentials here are admin and the password is PFSense all lowercase. Once you've logged in, you'll immediately be directed to the PFSense setup wizard. This will help us get everything quickly configured and you on the internet in no time. Click next to continue. NetGate offers support for purchase for those looking for that added peace of mind. If you're interested in learning more about this, you can click the learn more button. We'll click next. Alright, on the general information page here, you need to give your new firewall a host name. You can use any name you'd like, or you can even leave the hostname default as PFSense. We'll be using the hostname The Wall. Next step is to provide your internal domain name for your home network. Again, this can be any name you want, but it's best not to use a domain name that exists on the public internet, so don't name your internal domain Microsoft.com. 
we'll be using twoguystech.home as our internal domain name. Below we can specify DNS servers that we'd like our PFSense firewall to use for name resolution. By default, PFSense obtains DNS server information from the DHCP lease received from your ISP. If you have a specific set of public or private DNS servers you'd like to use to override the ones provided by your ISP, add them here. We'll be leaving ours default and clicking next. Next step is to set up time service on our firewall. We'll leave the default one here. You can enter an alternative if you have a preferred one. In the time zone dropdown, find your local time zone or leave it set to UTC. If you leave the setting on UTC, then you'll need to do some mental conversion of UTC to your local time zone when trying to match timestamps to local time. We'll be setting ours and moving on. Hit next to continue. Next up is to further set up your WAN connection to the internet. By default, we're set to DHCP, which typically works for most everything, but you might have a more unique WAN configuration required. If you do, you already likely know what the settings are that you need to provide here. We're on DHCP, so we'll scroll down and hit next. Next page allows you to change your LAN IP address and range if the defaults aren't acceptable. Remember that a change here will disconnect you from the firewall once the changes have been made and you'll need to reconnect at that new address. We're fine with the defaults here, so we'll hit next. Now we need to change the default administrator password since it's not secure and everyone in the world knows it. Enter your new password for the admin account and click next. Next step is to reload PFSense with the new configurations we've made here. Again, if you've changed your LAN IP address, you'll need to connect back at that new IP address. Now we'll wait for the reload to take effect and boom! We're done, congratulations on getting PFSense configured and ready as a basic firewall. Let's hit finish and do a quick walkthrough around the UI. Once again, we're greeted with the same copyright and trademark notices page that we accepted during the install. Just click accept at the bottom and if you feel like taking their survey, you can. We'll hit close. Welcome to the dashboard of your PFSense host. At the top of the screen, you have a menu system where you can move through the different sections that are grouped based on the settings they contain. Under system, you'll find settings directly related to the OS and PFSense itself. Here you can check for updates, install packages that will add functionality and features to your PFSense host, and more. Under the interfaces section, you can modify your existing interface connections as well as add more interfaces, both physical and virtual as needed. Under the firewall section is where you'll create firewall rules, make changes to your NAT rules, create port through rules, and more. Under the services section, you'll find additional services that are running on your PFSense host. These include things like DHCP services, NTP, SNMP, DNS forwarding services, and more. The VPN section is where you'd configure any VPN services for your PFSense box. This includes functionality like being a VPN endpoint for clients or configuring site-to-site -site VPN. By default, PFSense includes IPSEC, L2TP, and OpenVPN functionality out of the box, with WireGuard being installable via package using the package manager under the systems menu. The status section provides you access to the status of various services running on PFSense. Under diagnostics, you can find tools for troubleshooting like ping, traceroute, packet capture, current firewall states, and more. And that leaves us last with the help section, which contains helpful links to community forums, documentation, paid support, and more. One last thing of note, the dashboard is completely customizable using the available widgets to make it your own. For example, we can add a real-time graph of our network interfaces, drag the widget around where we'd like them to be, remove unwanted widgets, and more. Just remember to click the save icon at the top when you're done to keep your dashboard. There is so much more to PFSense than just a basic natting firewall. We highly recommend looking through the available packages to install, joining the community forums, and looking at more videos online so that you can learn how to extend the functionality even further. Tell us what you think of this video. We would love to hear from you. Would you like to see more how-tos? Let us know in those comments below. If this is the first time you've seen us, subscribe, do it now. We're on Twitter and Instagram, so go follow us and be all social. And finally, we have a Discord that we would love to have you join, talk about the videos we make, Home Lab, and more. It's a great community and we'd love to have you. Thank you for watching and we will see you again soon.